good afternoon. I figured out how to turn this on. I appreciate y'all coming to our learning cafe. I'm Ed Rogers. I'm a psychologist with the COE and one of the co-directors. Um, the usual housekeeping things I am in, uh, need to tell you is that there are snacks out in the hallway, which many of you have discovered. There are uh, restrooms at both ends of the hallway. Um, we have a survey that you were given in your packet. We would appreciate you filling that out and leaving it at the desk in the back when you leave. It helps us uh, know if we're doing a decent job and if there are anything, any topics that you would like us to present in the future. Speaking of the future, next month, um, August the 11th, uh, Dr. Caleb Corwin, one of our postdoctoral fellows, will be talking about uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, an introduction to what we know. This is the illness formerly known as childhood bipolar. Thank God they don't call it that anymore because it has nothing to do with bipolar. <laughs> Um, so, let me introduce today's speaker. Dr. Kristen Dean is the Project Manager of the Center of Excellence of, uh, of Children in State Custody. We are one of five across the state. She's been with us going on 10 years now. Is that right? Nine and a half? No, so a long time. Yeah, and she has uh, done a great job. Um, Dr. Dean is a psychologist. She trained at the California School of Professional Psychology and did her internship at Utah State Hospital. We uh, were lucky to uh, recruit her after she finished postdocs in the uh, University of Florida. She's uh, presented across the state on many topics about evidence-based evidence treatment. Uh, she is uh, board certified in clinical psychology. That's what the ABPP stands for. Uh, and she will talk to us today about uh, disruptive attachment and best, best practice guidelines. Dr. Dean. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Good afternoon. It's good to see you all. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about attachment um, in an hour, which is impossible. Okay, so just know that we're going to, you know, try and hit some highlights. My hope is to dispel some myths that are out there regarding attachment and attachment disorders, um, to define attachment. Um, not working, um, to talk about changes to the DSM. So the new DSM-5 has, has changed um, this, and, and I'll share some of the research, and um, hopefully that won't be too boring. So I'll go quickly through some things. I have like 60 slides, so we're probably not going to get through all of them, but you have copies of them, so um, if you have questions or there are things we don't get to, You'll have that information, and then, of course, please feel free uh, to contact me to see me after or email us anytime at the COEs. We're available for consultation, so, so we don't get through it all. Um, we really could talk about attachment for like two days, right? But we only have an hour, and my slides aren't moving. Right. Doesn't want to let me... Oh, there we go. Okay. Yay. All right. So, healthy development, right, is what we're talking about, and, and attachment's crucial to healthy development, right? So, it involves, obviously, an infant getting all their needs met, physically, um, but also emotionally, right? By definition, a child can't exist without a caregiver. An infant can't exist without a caregiver, right? Uh, there's no such thing as a baby, you've heard. Um, babies can't exist by themselves, right? They have to have us. Caregivers are absolutely necessary for their survival. So what happens in that relationship is incredibly important. Um, a lot of things, a lot of brain development happens um, through an infant's interaction with the caregiver, right? Um, and really, it's more than just the fact that infants are cute. Right? We sort of do this automatically, right? Whenever, whenever we interact with an infant, this is what we do, right? We have a couple of our staff members, Dustin and Caleb, soon to be, and Drew Berkeley with the COE, that all have babies now. We have this influx of babies. What do you think happens when they bring a baby into our offices? What do people do? Yes, <laughs> right? Right. So what do you notice in um, their facial expressions? 
What do you do? And what do you do if, if we brought if I got Dustin to bring his child in right now in front of us? Big smile, big facial expressions, right? Kind of exaggerated, eyes bigger. Um, what else? What else would you notice? What people would people be doing? Uh huh. Uh huh. What What do they do with their voice? Yeah, soft voice. It goes up. That's right. The pitch goes up. The tone is soft. Right. It's engaging. What about length? Like we hold babies like here. Some of us might. I used to before I had my own. Like ah. Right? What do we do? Where do we, what's the proximity? Yeah, close, right? We bring them in close. When we interact with them, it's like right here, right? So all this stuff we do naturally, and it's instinctual, right? But it serves a really important purpose. There's a lot of brain connections and a lot of things that are happening in that interaction. So that relationship serves to regulate um, infants. This is how kids learn to regulate, is through this reciprocal interaction with the caregiver. Um, soothing, stimulating, structuring, encouraging. Um, what do you do if Dustin's baby was in here and he started to cry? What would you do? What would, your, what would happen to your face in response to the baby crying? <laughs> here, take him back, right? We mirror them, right? The baby starts to cry, you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, and we try to sleep, right? What do we need? Give me a bottle. Give me a diaper. What do I need? You know? How do I fix this? Right? But we mirror them. When they're laughing, what do we do? We smile and we laugh in return. Right? It's reciprocal. And the infant learns that. It's like, oh, when I do this, they do this. They respond to me when I interact. And that teaches affect regulation. Right? Very important. And that sense um, of being develops from that. I know that when I when I react, this person reacts to me, and that sort of teaches me that I am a person, right? I learn that I am, I am a being, and it teaches me trust, right? When I have a need, they meet my need. Infants and toddlers want to please their caregiver. It's it's mutually rewarding, right? This reciprocal interaction is mutually rewarding on the part of the caregiver and on the part of the infant. It's really reinforced. I want to show you a still face experiment, and um, some of you have probably seen this before or something similar to it, that sort of demonstrates um, that reciprocity and how important it is to infants. Um, the link is in your slide, so for, there's some people that are watching us off-site, and I've been told that you might not be able to hear it, the video, but the link is there if you um, want to pull that up for yourself. Oh, <laughs> 
So, some of you have seen that before. Um, it's powerful, isn't it? Um, how do you feel when you watch this baby get distressed? Yeah. And it's awful. It's hard to watch. I'm glad they cut it off quickly at that point because it is hard to watch. And so, just in that tiny experiment, it just gives us a, a glimpse into what goes on for an infant when they have a neglectful caregiver, right? When they're not getting that serve and return, right? When they're not getting a caregiver responding to them and what that looks like. So um, this is a graph created by my colleague, John Ebert at Vanderbilt, which just kind of shows like a healthy attachment cycle, okay? So a child has a need, they express that need through crying or verbalizing if they're old enough, reaching. The caregiver meets that need, the child learns that relationships are predictable, right? When I cry, this person responds to me, right? And it's not about being perfect every time, but being consistent enough that the child recognizes that, that this is how things go. And so when that happens, by meeting the child's need, it really lowers the child's arousal. Um, and helps them regulate, as we talked about. And they get to experience this normal stress response, right? Of, I'm hungry or tired or whatever it is. I have this need and I'm upset, but then my need is met and I calm down. And then I have another need and I'm stressed, but the need is met and I calm, right? This normal stress response cycle. How many of you have babies? Besides Dustin. How many times a day do you meet your child's needs? like hundreds, <laughs> you know, right? You think about how many times you go through that, that normal stress response cycle. And, and with a consistent caregiver, that's how healthy attachment develops, right? And through that consistency of time and time again. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. And he was saying here, you know, when the mom was um, not attending, um, once she did, there was reparation, right? They quickly repaired. And so that happens in normal life, right? As a parent, you can't always meet the need right then. You got other things to do, but when you do, you repair. And there's enough consistency that the child develops that healthy sense of self and healthy attachment. So, I, so the infant learns to trust. My internal working model is that I anticipate future responses. I also recognize that I'm important because the environment responds to me, right? So that's sort of our healthy attachment cycle. So attachment's defined in a number of ways depending on who you ask, but um, in general, it's behaviors that we see in young kids when they seek comfort or support from an identified caregiver, okay? In our culture, there's usually one or two primary caregivers. Um, in other cultures, they have, kids have identified multiple if they're living in like a multi-generational family situation. Um, these behaviors first appear on the it's like the first year of life, sometime between 7 to 12 months, where you start to see preference for uh, a particular caregiver. So separation anxiety, I don't want to be away from mom. She leaves the room, I get upset. When I say mom, I'm really meaning primary caregiver, right, whoever that might be. And stranger wariness. Now, like, I don't want to go to people. So young babies, right, six months, younger, they don't care who has them, right? They just want to be held. If you're holding me, if you're feeding me, that's awesome. And, and not that there aren't cues, right, that, that they recognize caregivers. They'll respond to mom's voice and different things like that. But for the most part, they're pretty happy to be held. But as they start to get a little older, then, it, then you start to see that um, kind of wariness of strangers and really preferring a primary caregiver. Then as they get older, upward mobility, this was like pounded into my head by my developmental professor. It's not any mobility, it's upward mobility. Once they can walk, they want to explore, right? They want to check things out. It's this whole big world I want to, I want to see. But help, kids with healthy attachments will continue to come back to the caregiver, right? That secure base. 
called rapprochement, right? Where they go out, they explore, they check in, right? And you see this in young children, right? Hard, just watch them, for those of you with kids, right? Seeing them kind of going out, it might be a look, it might be coming back, that physical contact, then going out again, right? And the caregiver is the secure base, right? So this is um, a graph from the Circle of Security program, sort of demonstrating this. So it's, it's a really nice sort of illustration that is a parent represented by the hands, right? The open hands, but the parent is the secure base, and the child is going to go out. When the child does that, what the child needs us to do as caregivers is to support that exploration, right? We don't want to keep them with us, right? We want them to be able to explore in a healthy and safe way. So we're going to support explanation. We're going to watch over them. We're going to help them. We're going to enjoy with them, delight with them, support that exploration. And then when they come back, when they turn to come back, then the child says, I need you to welcome me. I need you to welcome me coming back to you. Protect, comfort, delight of me, help organize my feelings, right? It's that same kind of mirroring, right? When a child comes back, they're excited about something, we're excited too, if they're distressed, soothe them, okay? So this is kind of the healthy cycle. And honestly, like this doesn't really change as you get older, right? In healthy attachment, go back to go back to our secure base, right? Even if we're older. How many of you go back home or you call your mom when things are stressful? You know, that, that primary attachment uh, being strong in a healthy situation. So in terms of assessing attachment, um, the gold standard really is the strange situation. Mary Ainsworth in the 1970s, like this is still what is recommended in the literature for assessing attachment. And this is really, you're assessing the quality of that caregiving relationship. So there are different scenarios, but, but basically, what you want to do is see how they, how how are the parent, caregiver, and the child together. How are they when when they're apart, and then when they reunite, what does that look like? Um, you're looking for that secure base, right? Is the caregiver willing and able to soothe the child? Does the child seek out comfort from that caregiver? So, very consistently. And repeatedly in cultures all over the world, this sort of same pattern has emerged where um, kids are either securely attached, so they seek comfort from mom. If mom leaves and they're really distressed, when mom comes back, they go to her, they seek her comfort, she provides it, she's able to soothe, right? Everything's fine. It's not really about whether or not the child gets distressed when the caregiver leaves, it's how they behave when they come back together. Kids with an insecure attachment, um, either don't seek mom, stay upset, or they just sort of ignore her, disregard her, or they seek her out, but they're not easily soothed, right? Like, they sort of want that, but then don't get it, for whatever reason. Kids that are disorganized um, are kind of all over the place. Um, and, and a disorganized type of attachment is um, sort of seen as the most unhealthy. So, um, my colleague Jenny McPhee, who's at, at uh, UT psychology department, she studies she studies kids of um, moms with personality disorders, borderline personality disorders. Fascinating stuff that she does. Um, she kind of calls it the um, like the abused child who is seeking comfort, but um, the one who should be comforting them is the one person, right? So it's kind of ambivalence, like I like sh. I know that this is what I should be doing, but I'm afraid to do that because it's dangerous. So these are not related to DSM diagnoses at all, okay? Just sort of giving you information about how there does seem to be this kind of clear pattern of secure and unsecure and, um, and this disorganized behavior. So, so what that means is not exactly clear. Like I said, disorganized attachment is thought to be the least or the most problematic as, as folks get older, but even that is not like tied to like a specific diagnosis or condition in adulthood, okay? It just kind of represents this difficult relationship. Some risk factors for poor attachment. So, so what kinds of families are most likely to show up with poor attachment? And of course, um, none of these is you know, sufficient in and of itself, right? It's usually a combination of things, but can include poverty, 
right? Lack of resources, maltreatment, certainly institutional care. So this is kids that are raised, um, usually it's overseas, you know, we really try to keep kids and families to the best that we can, but he's raised in institutions for long periods of time. Um, marital discord, partner violence, and then certainly issues with the caregiver, right? If the caregiver is unable to meet the needs of the infant for a number of reasons, like mental illness or substance abuse or their own trauma, right? All kinds of things. So it's really can be a combination of things. Um, and so this is sort of the maltreatment cycle, the opposite of our healthy attachment cycle. Of course, when a caregiver is either unresponsive or inconsistent or abusive, um, then what does that tell the child? That, you know, I can't trust things, of course, right? Relationships are unpredictable or maybe even dangerous or chaotic. And so the child feels out of control. They don't know how to regulate themselves. They don't get that opportunity to regulate with the caregiver, which kind of puts them in a state of chronic stress. So relationships are unsafe. I either need to, um, you know, constantly be on guard for things, or I need to just shut down, it's just safer, um, not to express needs, um, clearly I don't matter, you know, people aren't responding to me or they're responding to me consistently, um, anticipating future harm, you know, not, um, things are safe, I have to protect myself. Um, so you can see how that can happen. Um, just so many of our kids, you know, with, through the COE and the kids that we see in state custody, neglect is the number one reason kids come into custody, right? It's by far the most pervasive form of child abuse. And it is child abuse, anybody asks you, right? If your life is dependent on your caregiver, that's life threatening, right? If your caregiver is not meeting your needs. So, so this is how kids can develop those unhealthy attachments. So just very quickly, um, I want to talk about the DSM-5. Um, so the attachment disorder diagnoses in the DSM have really um, varied through the years, um, and they've altered the criteria um, kind of each time. And the last edition before this one, the DSM-4, they sort of broke it out into two subtypes, character attachment disorder, um, inhibited and disinhibited. They have sort of always agreed that, that attachment problems are the result of maltreatment of some sort, and how they've defined that has varied. Um, grossly pathogenic care has been kind of the most recent definition. But that you can see that there has always been this, like it needs to be identified early. So at first it was like present by eight months. So I don't know about you, but I have a hard time getting history on a lot of my kids, and I can't imagine trying to figure out what their attachment behavior was prior to eight months old. That'd be really hard. <laughs> so I have a hard time getting, you know, within the first five years, which is, which is what the current uh, criteria is. But anyway, but there are a lot of problems. There historically have been a lot of problems with this diagnosis because um, there wasn't a lot of evidence. We're going to talk some about, um, about the research and some history because certain patterns have been consistent over time. But, but we didn't have, like, good validity studies until after the diagnosis already existed. Um, there's a lot of comorbidities, right? So a lot of things get put onto attachment disorder. What are things you think of when you hear, somebody says someone's diagnosed with reactive attachment? What do you think, like what pops in your head? Trauma, out of control, what else? Uh-huh, affect dysregulation, out of control. Does anybody, does anybody think of antisocial, or have you heard that? Maybe you don't think it, but you've heard it. Yeah, that's kind of, somehow it's become tied with conduct disorder kinds of behaviors and all kinds of other things. So certainly a lot of things seem to go with it, but um, kind of the, some of the understanding in the, in the public is a little skewed. So also it's like the only attachment diagnosis we've had, and you know, it's it's very rare, right? That particular disorder is very rare, but attachment issues are not necessarily that rare, especially among kids in foster care. So, so it's like on the one hand, um, 
we're probably under attending to attachment issues by not recognizing the importance of that, of that early attachment. But at the same time, we're putting kids in a, in a category that's not necessarily fitting. Like, it's sort of like we only have this really one extreme diagnosis and nothing in between, nothing to kind of demonstrate that there's a continuum, maybe, of, of attachment issues. So, um, Anyways, um, it really is meant for younger kids because that's when attachment forms and that's when we really should be intervening. But sometimes older kids are diagnosed with this and we don't have the very poor data on attachment behavior in older kids. We went through this period where it really became sensationalized and it was like on 2020 and all these like really radical therapists got therapies um, became popular and so it was in the media a lot for a while. So anyway, so they revamped it a little bit, the DSM-5. Um, again, there's, there's broad consensus that, that inadequate caregiving is what causes poor attachment. Um, the two clinical patterns that have been evidence for a while that were just part of one diagnosis, they've now split it. So there's two different diagnoses. So um, kids that have the emotional withdrawn and are more inhibited, this is the reactive attachment disorder of infancy or early childhood. The second diagnosis kids that are socially indiscriminate, who like, first time they see you, they like jump into your lap. You ever had that? <laughs> you do an intake with a kid and they're like all in your lap and you're like, okay. This either means I'm the best therapist ever, right? Or maybe there's some attachment issues here with this child. Okay, so those kids are the disinhibited social engagement disorder. That's the new diagnosis in the DSM. So they just have taken this, again, the same kind of patterns but split it into two diagnoses. So the criteria hasn't changed a whole lot for reactive attachment um, from the DSM-4. Consistent pattern of inhibited emotionally withdrawn behavior toward adult caregivers. The child has to have both of these. They rarely or minimally seek comfort when they're distressed. And they rarely or minimally respond to comfort. So it's hard for caregivers to see them. They don't seek it, and when they get it, they don't respond to it. And again, this is toward adult caregivers, like whoever their primary caregiver is. They also have to demonstrate some type of social and emotional disturbance. So there's like three things here about either being limited emotionality, limited positive affect, or irritability. Um, of course, this is caused by insufficient care. So they changed the wording from um, pathogenic care sufficient care. So now, so they just give some examples, social neglect or deprivation, repeated changes in caregivers, or being reared in unusual settings of like institution that limits the chance to form attachments. Okay, again, that is responsible. The insufficient care is responsible for the, all these other symptoms. It's very important. So you have to, before you can diagnose a child with that, you have to be able to demonstrate that that was present, that that um, insufficient care. And it's not just being in foster care, right? Like just being in foster care is not sufficient for a child to get this kind of diagnosis, right? Um, this is important. Um, autism is a rule out. So if a child meets criteria for an autism disorder, you give an autism disorder and not reactive attachment. This is something our developmental folks uh, grapple with. Dr. Allen and I have had many conversations about how do you tell in a two-year-old they're autistic or if they have an attachment disorder. That can be tricky. But if they meet criteria for autism, that's the go-to. There have to be symptoms before age five. Again, they have to show, you know, attachment behaviors start around the first year, and so you have to be able to demonstrate that these were present prior to age five. And the child has to have a developmental age of at least nine months. Again, because that's when attachment behaviors appear, right? Then you can specify if it's persistent, if they've had symptoms for more than a year, and you can specify if it's severe, meaning they have like all the symptoms and they're, um, they're at high levels, okay? Disinhibited social engagement disorder. So this behavior is when the child actively approaches and interacts with unfamiliar adults, right? They don't show any stranger wariness um, towards people they don't know. Okay, so they have to have at least two of these, which is um, no reticence or reduced reticence, overly familiar uh, verbal or physical behavior, right? So like sharing every detail about their lives or that, that inappropriate physical closeness, um, either diminished or absent 
checking in with the caregiver. So they're just fearless, right? Go off, do anything, whatever. Don't sort of check back in how things are going with the caregiver. And willingness to go off with an unfamiliar adult without hesitation. Okay? Uh, this is not just limited to impulsivity, right? But it's social disinhibition. So that can be sort of a tricky rule out because kids with ADHD are also very impulsive and will like tell their story to people in the lobby or, you know, do things like that. So you have to sort of look for that socially disinhibited piece, not just being impulsive, right? But this really kind of lack of attention to, um, lack of concern with going off with adults, not checking in with the adult caregiver, those things. Okay, insufficient care also has to be present, same thing, okay? and the insufficient care is, is thought to be responsible for all these symptoms. Developmental age is the same. Um, the specifiers are the same. Okay, so why did they decide to change it? So in the last one, it was like, you know, their the thinking was, well, they're both, you know, insufficient care is responsible for both, so um, these are just these two patterns. But they really decided that there's a lot of things, there are enough things that are different about them that they should just be their own diagnosis, even though sufficient care is responsible for both. This was an interesting study from the 70s, actually, um, just as an example of how these patterns have been pretty consistent. Um, the Desired London Nursery Study, um, they had uh, this interesting setup where, where um, kids were in, um, in, this, in this institution, but they had, like, everything they needed. They just didn't, the caregivers were just told not to bond with them. So it's like they had food, you know, they were able to control for all these environmental factors and just look at caregiver because they kind of had everything they needed, but caregivers were instructed not to bond with them. And so they had this natural pattern sort of form where a third of the kids were withdrawn, as we would think of reactive attachment, a third were disinhibited, and then a third still showed an attachment. Anyway. Um, so just an interesting pattern. There have been several studies that showed similar patterns. And actually, the ICD-10 split this before, DC, before DSM did, which probably helped influence some folks to split it. So some of the differences between the two, um, for the reactive attachment kids with, with, that are withdrawn, um, their most common comorbidity is depression, right? These kids are withdrawn, they're sad, not interacting. Um, and very importantly, it resolves with access to an adequate attachment figure. That's the treatment of choice, right, for a reactive attachment kid is to put him with, him or her, with an appropriate caregiver, an adequate attachment figure, right? And again, the, te the key deficit for these kids is lack of attachment behavior toward a primary caregiver. I mean, that's really what you're looking at. It's not about how they are with other people. It's how are they with that primary caregiver? Do they have that um, attachment behavior with them? With the disinhibited kids, their big comorbidity is impulsivity, right? And this is very interesting. These behaviors are more likely to persist even with adequate caregiving, okay? So these kids, when placed in a good home with adequate caregiving, they can still form an attachment with their caregiver, but they, many of them will continue to be disinhibited socially. So that manifests itself very differently. And the key deficit here is how are they with unfamiliar adults, that unmodulated, undiscriminate social behavior with unfamiliar adults. We're not really looking at um, attachment towards a caregiver. It's really about their behavior with others. So I think they felt like there were enough differences, these two things, that they separated them. Just a couple other quick facts. Um, with the withdrawn kids, there are no reports of reactive attachment without emotional neglect. So like physical abuse, sexual abuse, those things do not seem to, to lead to reactive attachment. Neglect really is the key. Um, for the disinhibited kids, think it's still sort of unresolved why um, they can't seem to attach when they, when they get a, a good caregiver, but they continue to be socially disinhibited. Strong correlation with ADHD, there's some thinking that um, Kids with Williams syndrome um, have similar patterns of social disinhibition, and they, so they wonder if there's like a genetic component. Um, and it seems to be that the disinhibited kids predictive of 
um, functional impairments, which makes sense socially, right? Uh, beyond early childhood, so what about those older kids that are diagnosed with reactive attachment? Um, the truth is most of the research is with young kids, right? Like we just don't have good research with older kids, and there's no good like longitudinal studies following kids who are diagnosed early. Um, Charlie Zena and his folks at Tulane, it's like the reading, leading attachment researcher, he would say if they truly did have reactive attachment, it's going to resolve with a good caregiving system. So when you have kids diagnosed older that have these other things, maybe those other things aren't really attachment issues but something else, or maybe it is an attachment issue but it morphs as they get older. The truth is we just we don't have good research about that. So they've said, you know, that when, you know, to attach or, or to study attachment in older kids, you, of course, you're going to use different measures, you're going to use different scenarios, you're going to do a strange situation with an older kid, because that doesn't make sense, right? So are you really studying the same thing, or is it something else, or is it something that just won't? We don't really know. Pauses, caregiving environment, talked about. Um, just more examples of research. Um, Again, with the disinhibited kids, as I said, it's um, kind of mixed results that, that the caregiving doesn't necessarily change the indiscriminate behavior or it can persist. Um, one study of kids in foster care found that the number of displacements was more highly correlated with uh, the disinhibited behavior than the severity of the maltreatment. So what about the kid? Is there, are there factors in children that make them more vulnerable to this? Um, this is very important. Most kids do not develop an attachment disorder even if they were maltreated. Okay? That attachment instinct is incredibly strong, right? And so you all probably have worked with kids who have, you know, have had terrible caregiving environments they are attached to that caregiver, and sometimes it's frustrating to you that they are attached to the caregiver who has harmed them, right? Most kids do not develop an attachment disorder, even in the face of maltreatment. Um, so this study, um, English and Romanian adoptees study, um, sort of wondered if there's a sensitive period, like if you can get them placed within a certain period of time or by a certain age, does, is that a mitigating factor? Um, you know, they found that kids adopted after six months tended to show more of the indiscriminate behavior later on. So that's one study, you know, there's more that needs to be done with that. Uh, mixed results with respect to IQ, some seem to think that is um, it's a mitigating factor, others don't. Um, again, with the genetic stuff, they haven't, there's no evidence that that seems to be true for kids who develop reactive attachment, but for the disinhibited kids, they think maybe, but we don't really know. We don't really know. Um, course of outcome. So in one study, kids who were, who remained institutionalized, okay, who had developed a reactive attachment remained in, and remained institutionalized, they followed them up to 54 months old. And at follow-up, only half were still showing symptoms. The other half were not, which is interesting, remaining in the same setting. Um, with, with the disinhibited kids, it it's really has varied. So some, this one study shows some behaviors up to eight years old. Some have suggested that they still have difficulty with their peers into adolescence. So differences with that. Intervention, okay, being placed with the family. That's, that's what they say, and, and an adequate caregiver. So um, again, several studies, once they say once kids They've been diagnosed, they meet criteria for reactive attachment, and then they're placed with an adequate caregiver, their symptoms dissipate, they're able to attach. This is a big myth, too, that I want to dispel, that some families here, you probably have heard this, or they come to you and say, so-and-so told me because my child has reactive attachment that they will never attach. False. That is false. Please tell parents that that's false. Can you imagine thinking that your child's never going to attach you, and it's never going to be healthy, and it's destined to be social harm? It's false. Um, Maltreated kids placed in foster care can form secure attachments comparable to non-maltreated kids, right? So they can, they can have, they can develop a secure attachment. 
Um, however, the quality of the attachment is important and it's in part dependent on the caregiver. Okay? If you have a securely attached caregiver, chances are far greater that the child will develop a secure attachment. If your caregiver is insecurely attached, that might cause problems, understandably, right? If a caregiver has their own attachment history that's not so healthy, um, it might be harder for them, which is going to make it harder for the child. So um, it's more likely they can develop some type of, of disorganized attachment if their foster parent or what, whichever caregiver is insecurely attached. So that's important too. Thinking about placement, and you're working with families. You know what is the caregiver's attachment history? It's worth exploring. Um, so disinhibited kids, I already said they mixed results following adoption. Um, so they seem to be able to attach fine, like they can they will attach with a caregiver, but they might still have this kind of indiscriminate behavior. Um, Quality of care in the one study found a quality of care in adopted home was not really related to instrument behavior. So even though they had good quality caregiving, um, some indiscriminate behavior happened. I'm going to just um, not spend much time on this, but except um, except just to say to be aware that there are these um, kind of other theories out there about attachment and proponents who suggest doing things that are a little more radical and that are not mainstream and don't have good evidence behind them. So just to be aware of those when families ask you about them. If you Google attachment, you're going to get all kinds of stuff, <laughs> okay. Or attachment therapy, or attachment theory, There's all kinds of stuff out there that, that parents read, have questions about, or hear from other people, word of mouth kind of thing. So just know, you know, um, research supports that it's really about caregiver qualities. Okay, that determine attachment. And so if we want to intervene effectively, we by definition have to work on the relationship with the caregiver, right? And the caregiving environment, that's, that's what the treatment is. There is, um, there are some folks who believe that you have to fix the child, that the reason the child's not attaching is because they have repressed rage from their former bad experiences, and so we need to like get that rage out and get them to reattach by regressing them and doing all kinds of Interesting thing. So, um, this is just this is one example of a checklist that's up on the internet that says if your child has any of these symptoms, they have RAD. And you know, there's things like bossy, and, you know, fully sleeping, learning learning disorders, and all kinds. Of so just know that this stuff is out there. Um, it's no good. Some you know some folks have have you know, soften their stance. So we know that, you know, following um, some child deaths using holding therapy, some um, therapists went to jail and there were all kinds of sanctions and all these professional organizations kind of came out and spoke against it. So I don't hear much about holding therapy anymore, but um, but a lot of a lot of folks still advocate for this like attachment parenting where it's really about obedience and kind of having kids practice forced eye contact and um, not letting them interact with anybody else, removing anything extra out of their room, not letting them have any excess stimuli, um, being just in total control of the child. And again, the focus is really on obedience rather than the relationship. So just be cautious when you hear those things and educate parents about you know, what we know about what works and what's effective. Um, so best practice with recommendation. These actually were put out in 2006, but um, have been endorsed by lots of professional groups and, and really just are about the do's and don'ts in terms of um, attachment issues. So so one is like assessment guidelines. So keeping in mind that this, you know, both of these things, reactive attachment disorder, social disinhibition, disinhibited social engagement disorder, are rare. Okay, so just keeping that in mind. Kids are rare. Even if you work with high-risk kids like we do, right, kids in foster care who have been maltreated. Even in that population, it's rare. One, one article I read said um, it's extremely rare in the general population. Even in clinical, clinically maltreated kids, it's still rare. Maybe less rare, but nonetheless, OK? So be cautious of that. You know, um, consider cultural issues. You know, if a child doesn't make eye contact, it doesn't necessarily mean they have an attachment disorder, right? Um, consider cultural context, um, what the family 
like in other situations. Obviously, we want to look at samples of behavior across situations with multiple caregivers, right? Not just one report, but how are they in lots of settings. Only use empirically supported checklists, so I've given a couple of examples there. Again, the, the gold standard for assessment is seeing them together, separating, and bringing them back together. You could do that in your office. You know, there are um, there are checklists you can use and, and different forms that can go with that, but just you, you just want to like quick and dirty, like how is this attachment relationship? Just do that. Have mom leave your office, have mom come back in, see how they do. Um, make sure they're diagnosed by a licensed professional. Um, so we see this with our DCS kids a lot through the COE where there will be a diagnosis of reactive attachment, but we don't know where it came from. And it's like it's made its way into the history, <laughs> the social history. We're going back through the records trying to figure out where did this come from? Who diagnosed them with this? Um, I've heard just stories from several colleagues about the deleterious effects of doing that. Like some, they, they, some, someone somewhere got this diagnosis and then it just has been carried with them and they can't get adopted and they can't. All this stuff because people have this like um, this misunderstanding about what, what it is or if, it, if it's even accurate. I, a colleague of mine said that she um, she, she got a kid who was transferred to her and she was trying to find, same thing, like the parents said, oh, she's been diagnosed with Brad and so she's looking through all her records and she can't find where it came from and then she comes up on a medical record and the girl had been diagnosed with reactive airway disease, RAD, and somebody mistranslated that and now so she has the attachment disorder diagnosis. <laughs> right, right. So be careful about that. Obviously, consider more common disorders. You know, if a child is defiant and acting out and um, has troubles with authority, then like diagnose them with oppositional defiant disorder. Right? If that's what it is, like um, just be careful not to sort of overdiagnose a child with an attachment disorder just because they were in foster care or based on sort of these myths about what else comes with reactive. Um, obviously, don't use physical or psychological coercion with kids. It's not good, right? Don't assume that kids with behavior problems are like destined to end up in prison. And when you have parents that ask you stuff like that, you know, do your best to educate them. Um, certainly, don't want to use any intervention that portrays the child negatively. You know that this is within the child. That the child is the problem. We need to fix the child. This is about the relationship, and should always be working with the caregiver. So suggestions for interventions, it's not like there's um, a specific intervention used to develop attachment, but it's things that we know work. So short-term goal-directed evidence-based approaches focused on obviously safety, you want to make sure the child's safe. The caregiver, you want to help them with patience, sensitivity, consistency, and nurturance. All of our treatments with kids with an attachment issue, caregiver has to be involved, right? By definition, that's what is going to help build the attachment is the quality of the caregiving environment. So you have to be working with caregivers. Um, they will need a lot of education and support. Okay, not that it's easy. It's hard to discipline a child who is not attached to you, right? You get a child in your home, you're trying to give them everything, and they don't have that relationship. It's hard. Parenting these kids are hard, for sure. And so parents need a lot of um, support in trying to do this. They're going to say, you probably have heard this, <clears throat> you're working with kids in foster care and the foster parent says, I parented four other kids and everything was fine. Like, I don't understand what's going on with this kid, <laughs> right? Say, you're right, because you had a healthy attachment with those other kids. This, this is hard for this kid. We, need, we can build that attachment, but it's going to take time and it's going to be, going to require a lot of patience and consistency and nurture. Okay, so with the parent, education support, just behavior management, helping the parent with, ba with basic behavior management skills. Um, working with them together um, through therapeutic activities, giving them feedback, helping the, helping the parent respond appropriately to the child, helping the caregiver do things like mirroring and stuff that some of the, that the child might not have had as an infant, right? We want to help them um, build that again to help so the caregiver can help the child learn to soothe and some of those things. Don't see the child by themselves, okay? Because it's not about the child. It's about the relationship, right? It's about the caregiver. The only, the only reason you might do this is if you need, the child, you 
want to help the child feel safe or you need to establish some kind of therapeutic relationship with the child, okay, but that's it. Otherwise, um, you're meeting with them together. So some relationship building kinds of skills, um, doing time in rather than time out. If a child, you try to build that attachment, um, sending a child to time out, um, you know, the best thing for building that relationship, right? Helping the child feel rejected. So instead you do time in, you do schedule time together, spend time doing child-directed activities, okay, where, the, where you let the child take the lead. Bill Allen will say, you know, there's no rules, like, you know, it's not, there's no competition, you're not keeping score, something where the child um, gets to take charge and the parent just follows the child's lead and practices that positive attention, praise, um, mirroring, narrating what the child's doing, all those kinds of things. So again, using that mirroring and reflection, so narrating activities while they're playing, mirror their feelings, right? Mirror their facial expressions, label their feelings. The child is having a hard time with that, so again, helping them to soothe. And then a basic behavior mod kinds of things for parents. This can be really tough, focusing on positive reinforcement. For a child who's um, having a lot of acting out behaviors, right, and not responding because you don't have a good relationship with them. So parents are like constantly putting out fires and it's hard to get positive attention. And so this is one they really need to practice. And most, most good um, interventions, um, parenting interventions and behavior modification interventions, do this first, and they'll say, you can't, you're not going to get anywhere with trying to do discipline or consequences if you don't have a relationship. So start there. Start with the positive. Again, this is really hard for some parents, but we'll like practice in session. We will be like, I'll make up things for the child to do to give me an opportunity to praise them, right? So I'll do things like, I'll print something out or I'll have something on my desk and I'll say, Johnny, go hand this to your mom. And when he does it, I'm like, that's awesome. Good job. You're such a good listener. I love how you did exactly what I asked. And then I'll do some, you know, like make things up for them to do and model that for the parent, like simple things you can praise. And you have to talk to parents about like expectations, right? What are your expectations for this child? We got to start low on some kids, right? <laughs> Bare minute, like find things to praise this child for. The more attention you give to something, the more they'll do it. That goes for negative things too, right? So helping them, that positive enforcement, and then helping them set rules. Sometimes we'll just do this in session together, just meeting with parents about what are the rules, helping make sure that they're age appropriate, developmentally appropriate. Um, start small, you know, just like let's pick one or two things, like let's not have like a list of 20 rules. Okay, let's start with something small and go from there. These are some examples of um, evidence-based interventions for attachment. PCIT, parent-child interaction therapy, is something that, that we've been spreading in East Tennessee. So folks at Cherokee, McNabb, Camelot, Frontier, one of the CACs, I'm trained. there are a few in this region. So that's um, for kids 2 to 7 with, that have to find behaviors. Okay? Parents can't get them to mind. And it, starts by focusing on the positive. And this is really a terrific intervention, by the way, and it's like has the best evidence base of it. Like the effect sizes for PCIT are huge. Like uh, it's very powerful. So, and part of why I think it's so effective is that it's just it's the parent and the child together and the therapist is like not even there. Like the therapist is in the other room coaching the caregiver through an earpiece, say this, do this, <laughs> right? And the parent's like, uh, this. okay. You know, they just sort of do it until they learn it themselves. And once they've mastered that, then they learn how to give a consequence. But only after they've mastered, like they have to demonstrate that they can give, they have like numbers, you have to code it all, and it's all very like detailed. The parent really has to. It's really about the parent, right? That therapy is really about teaching the parent how to manage the child. And it really does improve relationship and compliance. Attachment and biobehavioral catch-up, that's an um, in-home intervention. You can do it with kids even younger than two. Um, so therapist goes in and works, again, with mom and the, and, um, the child together. I think you can start as early as six months. I mean, I think you can start before they're even a year old, and it's helping them with that relationship and helping teach the caregiver how to attune to the baby and develop that relationship really early. Also has very good, very good research behind that. 
the COEs have talked about trying to do this, but it's, it's difficult to disseminate. So we're still working on it, but, but that's a very promising intervention. Circle of Security, this has been around for several years. Also very good intervention. That was their model that I showed earlier. Um, and working with the parent on how to attend to the child. Incredible years. They have different versions of this one for caregivers and teachers, like they even brought it into the schools now. Um, parenting to buy a child. Other things you might have heard about, um, I put up here, they don't have um, as strong of evidence as the others, but um, they're well regarded in, um, in the literature and, and probably more will be coming. So the ARC model, attachment, self-regulation, and competency, this is really a trauma um, framework, if you will. It's not, um, it's not necessarily kind of a step-by-step -step ther manualized therapy, but, it, but, it's, but it's kind of a structure or framework in terms of helping kids with trauma histories. And the very first thing you do is work on attachment. And it's, um, again, helping the caregiver to attune to the child's emotional state, regulate themselves, and then, learn, and then help the child learn to regulate. Um, so from the APSAC, some of their, their recommendations for professionals, um, some of these are you know, sort of obvious, but um, just being cautious about prescriptions based on word of mouth, right? Make sure you're, that you're looking things up. Is it in the research or evidence to support it? What are, what are people saying about it? Um, high ethical standards in advertising. So this is something you can educate families about because there are websites for certain interventions that um, claim that they're the only thing that can help kids with the reactive attachment disorder. Like this is the only intervention that works. And it works 100% of the time. And they will just make these claims that are outrageous. And if you're a desperate parent who's adopted a kid and you're having a hard time, you read that and go, OK, this is what I have to do. I have to like move my family and do this radical treatment for a month or whatever. So just letting parents know that that's like most professional organizations don't support that kind of attention. You should never claim that only one thing helps and that it helps 100% of the time, right? Those kinds of things. Patient testimonials, a lot of the websites will have, you know, testimonials from patients, but they, again, they don't have good research, they don't have evidence. So tell parents that their kids can be treated, that just because they have some attachment problems doesn't mean they always will, doesn't mean they can't attach going to go to prison, okay, that they're, it's tough, it's hard to work with, but, um, but we can do it, kids do get better. And some of these coercive therapies they might have read about, not only, you know, some of them kill kids, which is bad, but also, like, there's no evidence, like this kind of really strict parenting stuff, there's just no evidence that it works, so why do it? Um, okay. And that kind of standard safe, effective treatments are available. Okay, phew, we made it. Questions? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's a good question. So the question was, you know, for reactive attachment, you're looking at the relationship with the child and the caregiver, and can they be sued by the caregiver? So the question is, um, what about if they can be sued by somebody else? Or can they be? I mean, potentially, if they, you know, whoever, if there's somebody else they identify as a caregiver, say they're, you know, placed with a foster family, but they have a relationship with somebody else, you can be sued by that person, then they probably wouldn't meet criteria for reactive attachment, because clearly they have some kind of attachment with that person. Does that make sense? So in the cases of foster care, you know, you have to consider time and context, right? Like, like many kids aren't going to just immediately have this develop an attachment with the foster parent, you know, that could take time. They could have maybe relationships with others. Certainly. Yes, yeah. So can kids form attachments with other uh, people other than their primary caregiver, of course, yeah, like a sibling or relative. Right. Yeah, exactly. If they're yeah, if they're able to demonstrate an attachment, you wouldn't give them like the 
that touch my side. Exactly, exactly. That's why they, in, in assessment, they say it's so important to look across context and across caregivers. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so those outside, the question was, what about for kids who do have a conduct disorder and what information does that have for attachment? And I haven't seen any literature on that. You know, um, certainly kids can have both, right? They can be diagnosed with both a disorder behavior disorder and an attachment disorder. I haven't seen any literature that says um, kids with reactive attachment who are placed with secure caregiver will have will struggle more than you know, if they have conduct disorder versus kids that don't. So I don't know, it's a good question. The others that I can't answer? Thank All you. right, thank thanks you. everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Um, please. Sorry, Ed. Um, there's references, the very last page has references, everything that I said taken from one of those sources, so if you want to read more, there's some great information. Her website says that her uh, recommendations are them. No, just kidding. Uh, we we uh, will appreciate it if you fill out the form uh, evaluating today's presentation and if you turn it into Ms. Dr. Reed and back to the end of the room, uh, in the back of the room, she will give you a, uh, a certificate of attendance, which we will frame for an initial $30.